Hi, I'm Cindy Blake. I'm the Senior Product Marketing Manager for uh, Secure and Defend. And I did a session, a breakout session at Sales Kickoff that was focused on paths to ultimate. And uh, a lot of the discussion was around security. And it was a pretty passionate discussion with a lot of Q&A and interest. Um, and unfortunately, the audience was only uh, solution architects and TAMs. And uh, in retrospect, there's a lot of interest and applicability here to the other uh, sales uh, you know, account, account members. And so I wanted to be sure and record some relevant points um, that you all could use as well. So um, I'm not going to hit on uh, Samia's portion, which was some other reasons for Ultimate. I'm really going to focus here on security uh, just um, because that was kind of the sticking point that, that um, came up in the session. So jumping ahead, there's a couple of prerequisites that I want to make sure that everyone is aware of. In order for your customer to use GitLab secure capabilities, they need to be willing to use GitLab CI. Our secure capabilities are embedded within CI. So um, you can use it as a carrot or a stick, <laughs> not a stick, nah. um, maybe a bad, bad analogy there, but you can use um, secure to, as a reason for them to get onto CI potentially, um, but if they're not willing to get onto GitLab CI, then you may be barking down the wrong, up the wrong tree if you're trying to, to jump to a secure conversation. So um, just caveat there. And then the other thing is they need to be pursuing DevSecOps. Um, when we get into use cases, uh, you'll see that you know, this really secure and the way we do security scanning is really all about getting security into the DevOps workflow. And so velocity really needs to be one of their driving um, requirements. Compliance can be too, but I take that with a grain of salt. Really velocity is the driving factor if they're trying to shift left and do security earlier in their workflow. So I wanna help you with the right message for DevSecOps because Traditional security tools were intended for a waterfall process, which was, you know, I, I do all of my development and then in a test environment before I go to production, I do all my scanning. And that method is really incongruent with uh, the DevOps people processes and technologies and the workflow in short. And so that's where we get into the square peg of security into the round hole of DevOps and it just doesn't fit real well. And I want to highlight some ways that you can talk with your customers about this and, and what problems they're trying to solve. Now, before I do, though, um, a couple of, of contextual pieces. You know, as they're moving towards cloud native architecture, um, containers, orchestrators, and microservices become a real key part of their development effort. And each of these represents a new attack surface, which a lot of times the security department hasn't thought through. So they may not be scanning containers because quite honestly, they may not have even thought about it. They may not have thought about monitoring containers for security in a production environment. Similarly with Kubernetes and, and so forth. But the microservices here is really the driving factor around the iteration that makes that um, square peg in the round hole problem because you know, applications used to be monolithic and a developer would work on them for six months and, and make the changes that needed to be made. But with source code management, those monolithic applications could be broken down and chunked into smaller pieces that individual teams or individual people could work on. And then the source code management can manage those um, versions you know, do version control. So, um, it's those microservices, the fact that they're now coding smaller pieces. And so I can code a bunch of small pieces and then test them all at the end in, my, in a traditional application security testing method, or I can do all these small pieces of code changes and test them as I go. Um, and that's what we do. So if you think about what the incongruencies are, this might help you have a conversation with your customer and put you in more in their shoes. Um, you know, if they've been moving from uh, penetration testing, um, 
you know, those things have been um, kind of not sporadic, that's not the right word, but very much at the end in production. And what we're talking about is doing scans in development before it ever leaves that individual developer's hands. Um, we're talking about empowering the developer and you can, you can say, you know, the security team will always be outnumbered by the developers. And so the way to scale your application security program is to empower the developers, but they need tools and asking them to use a security tool like Fortify or Veracode, A, it wasn't intended for their persona, if you will. And, and so it's not very user friendly for them. And B, those things weren't intended to be in the developer's workflow. So they're really intended to scan an entire application at the end, not little pieces as, as you go. Um, so you can, I won't read the slide, you can read on here, but these are some of the differences between traditional application security and the way that GitLab does application security. So it's all about shifting left, moving thing, removing things early by the person that can actually do the remediation, which is the developer, not the security person. Um, you know, one other point I wanted to bring up because it came up in the, in the selling ultimate Slack channel that we created as a result of this session. Um, you know, some companies are shifting left by doing a, a, having a scanning in the web IDE. Um, I think Fortify has that, Veracode has that, there's several, but those are really kind of called light uh, static scans. They can't do a full static scan in that web IDE, and it's only one type of scan. We have five. We have static, dynamic, container, license compliance, and dependencies. And so, yeah, they're shifting further left with those SAS light uh, capabilities in the web IDE, but it's just a sliver of what they really need to be doing. Now, this is what I call our secret sauce, and it it's enabled by the fact that we are one application for the entire software development lifecycle. It's enabled by the fact that we embed security into CI. And that is that we do this, uh, the security testing on the feature branch. And the power that this enables is as a developer, I make a code change and I press commit, it's getting scanned in my pipeline and I get the results and it's, I made this code change, I made the vulnerability that resulted. It's not that Sally down the hall created the vulnerability and I'm having to deal with it now in my, you know, in my code, or that it's been lingering out there for two years and I'm the first one to change this section of code, so bam, it's my problem. This is very clear cause and effect where I made this change and as a result of my change, here's the vulnerability that I created. That is so powerful. In the current situation with most application security testing and the workflows, what happens is the testing is done by security at the end in production environment. And when I find all of these vulnerabilities as, as a security person, now I've got to work back and figure out who can fix them because finding them is only part of the problem. Fixing them is the bigger problem. And so I need to figure out, you know, who is the developer that can fix it? I got to prioritize it and get it into their work queue. And then because I'm responsible for risk and managing risk, I get pressure for, well, has the vulnerability been fixed yet? Well, I don't know. Let me go check with the developer. Let me go look back in another system. So that friction in that workflow is eliminated when you can empower the developer to just find and fix the vulnerabilities right there before it ever leaves their hands. Now, as I said, we run all of these security scans in development and the way that we do DAST is very different as well. So we use that review app as dynamic scanning requires a fully functioning application in order to do the test. We use the review app as that fully functioning application and we run DAST against that, and that's how we're able to do it so early in the game. And I don't know of anybody else um, that is able to do dynamic scanning that early. In fact, that's kind of the reason why interactive application security scanning, or IAST, was created, was because dynamic scanning was so late in the game, they wanted to shift left, so what they did was they created IAST in order to do that, and it, it's a combination of, um, 
instrumentation of the application and that dynamic uh, pressure uh, against this, um, the code. And so you might even be able to argue that maybe we don't need not I asked. I don't know. We've got it on our roadmap and that has yet to be determined. But the fact that we do DAST so early is very, very unique. Now, if I only had three slides to use, by the way, it would be these three. It would be the fact that we do the testing on the feature branch, all of the testing that we do in the development, and this iterative cycle. Because what this is showing is as the developer iterates on their code naturally, they're looking at, I made a, a code change, does it function the way I wanted it? Is my user happy with it the way, the way it was designed? And so as I'm iterating on those code changes, I'm also iterating on my security vulnerabilities and findings. And I can take three, um, three I have a choice of three actions there as a developer. If I can fix it, if I know what, you know what it is, how to fix it, and I have the time to do it, I can fix the vulnerability. That would be the preferred route. Um, I can create an issue and so that we make sure that it doesn't fall between the cracks and we deal with it, um, or I can dismiss it. Now, if you're talking to a security person and you say that dev can dismiss a vulnerability, that usually raises the hackles on the back of their neck and they'll say, oh my gosh, we can't have developers doing that because they'll just dismiss everything. But the key here is they, they can write an, a reason why. So there are some legitimate reasons for dismissing. It could be um, maybe it's a test database, so it really doesn't matter. You could argue that maybe it does. It depends on their risk appetite. Um, it, uh, you could say that there's a compensating control. So I may not be doing an input validation, but I'm doing it somewhere else. So there's reasons why they might legitimately dismiss the vulnerability. Now, when, um, but here's the key. When I merge my changes back into the master and it shows up in the security dashboard, that dismissal doesn't go away security can still see it. And that's really important when you get to the demo that you show security that they still see it. And everybody's looking at the single source of truth and the same information. So why we win and why this helps the, um, uh, the prospect is that all of these security scanning results are contextual. They're within the workflow. Um, the workflow works with the DevOps iterative environment. Um, and it's very efficient. So you can compare it to a phone, you know, your cell phone and your um, camera. You might want to use, you might still want to use the camera because it really is the best tool for taking pictures. If you're, you know, doing a family portrait or something, just like you may really still want to use, uh, you know, Fortify or Veracode or Black Duck or White Source, take your pick, your, your pick of your favorites. But when you're looking at shifting left and finding vulnerabilities earlier, you don't need to get into an argument over how many vulnerabilities do we find? What is the eff efficacy of our scanners? If you talk about the fact that it's integrated, so it's there and it's the results that are important and where they show up and how you use them. You know, it, it, on your cell phone, um, when you take a picture, it's all integrated with, you know, your social media and the internet. I don't have to find something that'll read a flash drive and then make sure that that's connected to the internet. So it all just works. And, you know, TSA scanning would be another uh, metaphor for this. Scan everything lightly. And then those things that are anomalies or, or randomly, you know, from a random QA standpoint, go deeper with a different scanner. That's fine. Um, you shouldn't be making the argument that we are a, you know, case for case replacement of these other scanners. It's really about shifting left. Let's scan everything early. And if you want to do the more in-depth scanners later, fine, you can do that too. But we can still save you money if you're paying by the scanner or by the, uh, uh, by, by the scanner, by the developer. Now, compliance in retrospect. Um, compliance really isn't a motivator for doing DevSecOps as much as velocity, but I put compliance in here because um, CISOs in particular are beginning to understand that GitLab is kind of the crown jewels, that if, I, if my development organization is putting all of their software in GitLab, that man, I better make sure I'm protecting GitLab and, and that it's compliant with some basic um, 
controls. And so you can talk with them about the end-to-end -end security of, of software has to do with not only application security testing that we've talked about, but protecting that application in production, which is where we're headed with Defend, and then policy compliance and auditability. So making sure that um, you know only legitimate developers have access to the code, for instance, and that I can look at who changed what, where, when, that becomes harder to do if I'm piecing together multiple tools. And then the platform security, so GitLab security in and of itself. And if you get people asking about how do you do multi-factor authentication, how do you, what are your access controls for the GitLab application, um, that really has to do with our security. There's a page if you, if you Google GitLab security that's run by our security team. So that's our CISO team. Uh, more or less, even though we don't have a CISO per se, but that's that's our security team. And if you get those kinds of questions around access to GitLab itself, talk with this in the security channel, not secure, but security Slack channel, ask those questions there. Um, we do have a compliance page out here that um, goes over some of the common controls, and I would encourage you to look at that and understand that uh, Jeff Burroughs and his organization can go really deep on how we, the, the controls that we have in GitLab and how we can help them be, uh, that customer be compliant with things like uh, ISO standards and um, PCI compliance and so forth. So uh, we did a poll here. Uh, I won't. The, the poll, by the way, that was in the session was um, what it came back is the biggest barrier was the cost jump from premium to ultimate. We get that. We understand. And there's two sides to that. One is the cost itself and the other is demonstrating the value. And on the cost itself, um, Scott Williamson has hired a PM for pricing and they have engaged a third party to do a pricing analysis for us. And in fact, in the Selling Ultimate channel, the gal that's uh, running that right now, Christy, don't quote me on her name. Anyway, it's in, the Slack, in that Slack channel. Um, she has um, asked for customers that would be willing to talk to this third party, this outside third party about our pricing. So if you have some, please send them her way. Um, now, let's talk about a couple tips and techniques. I went over some of these, but uh, so I'm going to zip through some, but I also want to get to some things that I didn't get a chance to talk about in the session because we got buried in, in Q&A. So I mentioned secret sauce here, embedded in CI, actionable, iterative, before the code is merged. Okay, covered that. It's not what scanner you use, but how timely you address the results. So if they ask, how do you compare with this scanner or that scanner or whatever, there's a million different scanners out there. Turn that conversation to when do you get those results? What do you do with them? Who gets them? How do you reconcile those results across different systems, across security system and your developer system and so forth? So these are questions to ask the developer. You know, are you getting security grenades that are thrown at the end of your SDLC? What sort of disruption does it cause? What would happen if you were able to see all of these vulnerabilities yourself before the code is merged. That's really key, before the code is merged. If you're talking with a security team, um, you know, they have, their, their challenge is taking the results that they found and tracking it back to who did it, um, how do they prevent it from happening again, um, how do I see if it was remediated, and, and so put yourself in the shoes of the security person and ask a lot of penetrating questions about the process that they use. If, if you're going up against Microsoft, um, Microsoft, you know, there's a, there were sessions at SCO at the sales kickoff that talked about um, the ELA, and I would encourage you to go look at those, uh, the competitive sessions. But it's really kind of some assembly required on um, Verify, Verify and Fort, Vericode, <laughs> Vericode and Fortify, um, you know, you'll get some things about, well, we have fewer false positives. Uh, there are even 
companies that are having developers use Fortify, which I think, ooh, if I were a developer, I wouldn't want to do that. But, and you can find results out there that show, you know, efficacy comparisons. I will tell you though, don't go down that path. Go down the path of the workflow um, because we don't have a real good set of results to say, here's a, an efficacy comparison. So focus on the workflow. Are they testing for the obvious use cases? Are they running Veracode and Fortify on a subset of applications? I guarantee they are not running those security scans on all of their apps. They're usually doing it for mission critical apps, which is a problem. I mean, Target was a prime example. They were hacked through their HVAC system and then th people traverse laterally. So they might be doing infinite security scans and finding lots of vulnerabilities on a couple of applications, but if they're not testing everything, it's like leaving a window open. And another seed you can plant is what happens when they find 10,000 vulnerabilities and it's at the end of the software development life cycle. Now they've got this technical debt to deal with. Um, and you could argue there was, there was a case, uh, Boeing, I think recently got into trouble because they knew about some safety uh, findings with one of their jets, but they didn't do anything about it. Is this not something similar? If you find all these vulnerabilities and you're not able to fix them right away, I, it, there hasn't been a case yet, yet, but my, I predict at some point somebody will get sued because you knew the vulnerability was there and you didn't prioritize it high enough to fix it. So again, make the case for dealing with the, the point at which the vulnerability is introduced, which is in development and fixing it there in a procedural method, methodological way, systematic way as part of the SDLC. Now, what are we good at and what are we not good at? We're good at the workflow. We're good at, um, at we're, we're starting some integration. So White Source has done an integration with us. There's a few others, Sneak, Sonotype. They've done them. They haven't necessarily done them in the most eloquent way that we would want. And we are working towards making it where um, it's more clear how they need to uh, integrate with us, having some standards there. So those integrations, uh, White Source has done a really good job. It shows up in the MR pipeline and it shows up in the dashboard and it says that it came from White Source, but you have to get ultimate in order to get those. So um, that they're kind of the poster child for doing it the right way. Um, where are we not good at? Well, that head to head comparison is a problem and mostly because it gets into a religious argument because if, if, a security person went out on a limb and, and told their CIO or their CISO, I need to spend a million dollars to buy Fortify or to buy Veracode. They've bet their career on that. They're not going to go back and say, oh, never mind, we don't need it now. We've got this other tool that, you know, so they're not going to do that. There's, there's some emotional ties to it. So don't get into that head to head argument. Okay. Talk about the workflow and how we can supplement. Um, there's a perception among security people that open source scanners are inferior. That study I showed on that one slide kind of shows maybe, maybe not. Uh, you know, they might be better in some areas and weaker in others. And as a middle of the road, they're a great uh, approach. But um, again, just kind of avoid that head to head comparison. Now, when you're head to head with Microsoft, though, we do have some shortcomings when it comes to .NET frameworks right now. So we're working on that, should be fixed in a few months, but just know that and then um we're not as good as some of the others on um some of the policy automation and reporting um particularly reporting to someone who's not a gitlab user again those are on the roadmap and we're working there but one, one should understand so maturity um there's this you know the great maturity page that's out there and understand our plan is to be complete this summer, so July of 2020, um, in most of the most of the categories. So we're not quite there yet. Um, so don't oversell it, um, and and we'll be adding fuzzing here soon. Now, um, in the demo, I wanted I have a couple slides in here that are demo slides with some red arrows of things I want to make sure that when you're doing a demo, you point out. This is really more for the essays. I didn't get to this in the breakout. Um, so in this MR um, pipeline result, 
you know, be sure you expand the, um, the findings. You can scroll through and show that SAS, DAS, Dependency Scanning, License Management Containers, it's all right here. You can drill down onto one. You can show that they're, if they've been dismissed, they're scratched out, but they are still here. Um, so it shows that they've been dealt with, but you can still see them. Go into the MR widget and show um, you know, all of the details that the developer is going to see. And this becomes important because you're going to show this exact same view when you get to the dashboard, that the security people are seeing the same thing as the developer. Everybody's on the same page. You can see here that an issue was created. I can drill down and see the issue and understand is somebody working on it, not working on it, and, and you know, give it a thumbs up if it needs more prioritization or whatever right from here. Now, on the, on the dashboard, a um, couple things. Right now, our default is to hide the dismissed items. I would encourage you, particularly if you're talking with a security audience, to toggle that off so that you see the dismissed items because that's what the security people care the most about. In fact, I think I'm gonna open an issue that says we need a view that, to just look at dismissed items. But um, you can see here that the information is similar to what the developer sees. And again, you can see that a, an issue was created that the dismissed items didn't go away. They're still here and you can drill down and see those. The other thing to point out on the dashboard, this is on the group dashboard, is this A through F academic grading scale. So if they're, if they're worried about managing risk, go to the F projects. Those are the ones that have the poorest grades on as post, you know, uh, for risk. And then again, drill down into that MR widget itself so that they reinforce the point that uh, it's single source of truth. Everybody's looking at the same information. One last point here around defend. We're not really talking about defend from a secure DevOps standpoint just yet, but know that it's out there. We do have a WAF that focuses on Kubernetes ingress at the moment. We want to be the best for cloud native applications, and so that's where we're really headed first. Um, but you can have a look at that. Um, there's some sales resources I want to make sure that you're aware of. There's a sales resource page you should be familiar with, and on that page is not only the pitch deck, but there's a security overview deck as well. Those are the slides that I use for every customer call. And I do two to three customer calls a week. So this is not just a pipe, you know, me, me pontificating. This, is, this works, I promise you, if you'll have these conversations. Um, there's a white paper that focuses on the shift left. Um, and then there's a book that I wrote on the 10 steps to secure next generation software. Um, that gets into not only the workflow, but secure, and it starts touching on setting up the case for Defend as well. And then coming soon, we'll have the content team, Vanessa's working on a maturity self-evaluation that they'll be using for demand gen that where people can answer 20 questions and decide where they fit in the uh, maturity there for Sec Dev DevSecOps. So know that on the ultimate side, the intent is to keep the MR pipeline for the developer and the dashboard in ultimate, even though we, we are shifting down um, SAS and some other scanners into um, the lower tiers. Um, the PMs are putting together a, um, a page that is gonna give you more information about what's res uh, retaining um, being retained in ultimate so that you have a better sense for the value that we bring. It's again, it goes back to the workflow. It's not wrapped up in the scanners themselves. You can put in it, our scanner, somebody else's scanner. It doesn't matter. It's that workflow. That's really important. Um, there is a slide in here, what's coming in ultimate and, and this area gets into these, these two boxes here at the bottom. Um, what's focused on secure and defend that's that's coming um, that's going to continue to bring more value on the ultimate side. And one last thing um, is Brian Wald um, showed he has put together a flowchart, um, more like a root cause analysis of what are the barriers to ultimate. And he put that in the Slack channel. Um, if you would. And, and it, 
the link is also down here in the notes. If you would go to that and see if it's complete. If there's other barriers that you encounter, uh, please let Brian know, add it to the issue or um, put it in the Selling Ultimate Slack channel. So hopefully you found this um, useful for you and if, uh, certainly you can reach out to me anytime with questions or to David DeSanto who leads um, the PMs. You know, we've ramped that team. I used to have one PM to, do, uh, to interface with and now there are, I think six plus David. So, um, you know, on the PM side, David can be your good single point of contact or on the PMM side, uh, I can. Happy to have conversations with your customers as well. So I hope this was helpful and uh, reach out if you have any questions. Thank you.